so commercial and in some cases so ugly, you saw with new eyes and uh, understood differently. Could you talk a little bit about the philosophy behind that? that One book? of the basic aspects of the philosophy was the whole notion of um, looking at what is and trying to look with sympathy rather than viewing with alarm. And um, one, among other things, we felt you have much more fun in life if everything you see isn't <laughs> horrifying. That's so true. <laughs> Bob, used to, Bob yeah. and I used to play a game which said, I can like something worse than you can like. <laughs> but that was very liberating, yeah. to shock yourselves into a new awareness. Uh -huh. And that came a lot from my training in England and then from the social planners. And they said things like this, um, People are very bored by the spaces architects make. And why don't you architects go somewhere where people vote with their feet? Mm. People go there. Yeah. See why they go there. Yeah. So when I moved from teaching at Penn to teaching at Berkeley, I partly went to look at the cities of the Southwest, the automobile cities and how they operated. And I stopped off on the way. I made six stops along the way. And one of the stops was Las Vegas, which I'd known about, I'd seen. And, yeah. um, so, and I was intrigued and entranced. And then when we were starting a new school at UCLA, and I had a good visitor's budget, and I asked my various colleagues to come and lecture to my students. So I asked Bob to come, and we gave the students a sketch design, and I took him to Las Vegas because I knew he ought to see Las Vegas. And did he react the way you oh, did? Oh, yes. Yeah, and it was the time of Tom Wolfe, so we'd been reading about the candy-colored streamlined yeah. tangerine, whatever it was called. But it's important when we're talking about Las Vegas, it is important to note that yeah. it's the Las Vegas of then, which was involved the urbanism uh, of the strip. Yeah. And it's not the Las Vegas of today, which is Disneyland and scenographic. So we must emphasize that it's the long of the past. And we were loving what we were doing was studying in general the uh, urbanism of the automobile urbanism, which again, modern architects didn't look at or like very much. Mm -hmm. So we loved Los Angeles, which was again ho horrifying to people. But we went to Las Vegas as sort of a smaller, simpler version of Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. You could say this, that um, in Las Vegas, the signs which are 12 feet high on a normal strip are 22 stories high. Yeah. And in New Jersey, it's overlaid on several other patterns, maybe going back some hundreds of years even. Yeah. And in Las Vegas, the strip, strip was in the desert. Yeah. So it was a very pure form. It wasn't a prototype, it was an archetype. And you could see it yes. plain, yes. so to speak. Now, did you f get a lot of flack for this? I mean, mm -hmm. this, I would imagine since ar architects tend to be, uh, am I wrong to say, an effete group in some ways, um, that they, the initial, a reaction might have been extremely resistant. Well, it's already started with complexity and contradiction. Yeah, and they were there was and opposition. And we've just to that. come back from lecturing at Delft in mm -hmm. Holland, and there was a thousand students came to this lecture. It was very moving. And then they still had TV, closed circuit TV, outside of that. And um, some of the students said to us, you know, even as late as three years ago, we couldn't have invited you because of the sentiment. Really? Against the you. Yeah. The faculty. Uh -huh. So it's taken but that it's still, long. Uh, yeah. That was, you know, we were outrageous then. Mm -hmm. Now we are boring. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. We went um, from, what did we used to say? We went from um, revolutionaries to old fogies without ever being establishment in between. Interesting. Well, I bet you still have your capacity to shock. I have that sense. Um, your recent book, um, Architecture as Signs and Systems is, I think, a wonderful book, and it, yet you can see the definite evolution and yet and repetition. I mean, uh, I guess those are terms even in architecture for your from your original um, uh, book. And I wonder how you feel your writing and your work has evolved and stayed the same. And I guess I could address both of you here. Um, in moving from that work, I guess it was written in what, 1966, to this present book, which was just published. Actually, it was written about 1962, 63. Okay. It took that long to publish. Really? Did it, so you had some difficulty finding it? Complexity the and yeah. contradiction. No, it just took the publisher a long time, but Bob was writing it 
1962 and 63. It's wonderful also to mention that it had a foreword by Vincent Scully, the, uh, the oh, great yeah. uh, famous teacher at Yale. And uh, I that had sort Vincent of helped. Scully at Yale. You did? Oh, really? I remember him. And, yeah. uh, he, uh, and so that kind of helped uh, get the book uh, more or less established. But actually, it was highly criticized, as Denise said. Well, it, it is true. Um, a while back, we gave a lecture. I think it was at Penn. And we learned later that someone said, oh, they haven't had a new idea in 40 years. <laughs> you mentioned that in That's your right. new and book. And we, we had yeah. fun saying, well, at least we have had an idea. But, uh, <laughs> a good idea. Right. Yeah. So but you, on you the other you hand, don't mind the fact you're that evolving. You, you know, I think your idea is often, you don't have to be, today there's this feeling in art, yeah. and maybe in other fields, where you have to be highly, you have to be revolutionary, you have to be original to be good. Right. And in that book, I, I, I kind of make a statement, historical statement, where I say, Michelangelo was not original, he was good. <laughs> and the, the, the idea of not having to change every month is, uh, is relevant. It's and so we have evolved yeah. rather than revolved. There are moments when it's important to be revolutionary, but it's also wrong if you're revolutionary just to appear romantically original. Mm -hmm. But in one thing um, that I did in my part of the book, I, I, I wrote about things which we normally don't write about, although in the office we work with them a whole lot. And so Bob's on record as saying 10% um, of what we do in the offices work on signs and 90% is something else. Well, I said, let me try to write about the 90%. <laughs> well, I didn't manage, but maybe I upped it to about 30%. And the pieces that I talked about are other kinds of ideas that are very much influence us as we make plans, as we design buildings, and as we think through the issues of buildings. There's many layers of thought, mm -hmm. and a lot of them, in our case, come from urbanism. Yeah. So that we make this claim of doing urban land use and transportation planning inside buildings. And I think that makes our buildings and our campus plans rather different for that reason. So I tried to share a lot of that. Some of it is very simple ideas and useful for students. Yes, I thought so too. In fact, I wanted you to address um, the university, the fact that you have done so much work with universities. Um, uh, you've designed buildings at Penn, of course, Princeton, Michigan, Dartmouth, Harvard, the University of Delaware, perhaps Drexel one day. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit, and yes, yeah, wh what are some of the things that some of the issues that you grapple with, particularly when you deal with a, a, a university structure, some of the challenges? Well, the university is, is, can be a wonderful client. One is because they are a client who keep building constantly, and so they're sophisticated clients. Mm. If, you build, if you design a museum, for instance, that's only once a generation, they add a wing or something like that. So the people that you're, whom you're dealing with are, um, are sophisticated and understanding in general. Um, also, there's the opportunity there to, to build uh, buildings that are, um, um, that are, as we call it, um, generic lofts, because classroom buildings and especially, especially um, um, laboratory buildings have, have been there have been a huge number of laboratory buildings now an enormous amount of investment in that and so we've been able to uh, do that and they've allowed us to employ ornament and they've allowed us to do uh, la uh, these lab buildings that connect that, that whose aesthetic derives from rhythm and then also we're very interested in the idea of community and Denise can talk about that too and to make the buildings in, in a way that inside they can um, uh, encourage uh, communication, conversation, incidental meeting, connections, which is so important. Which is so important. And we, we design them with, mm. with, little, with opportunities for Can you give an talking. example of that in one of your structures, of how you feel the structure has enc encourages communication? Well, all of our structures are thought of as having streets through them, mm -hmm. which are the major access corridors and circulation systems and the vertical circulation. And um, a lab building would be a very good example, but not only a lab building. And then where the major corridors meet the vertical circulation um, on each floor, we think of that as being like 
the marketplace where, where main roads cross and what you get at the marketplace, stores, yeah. places to sell. So at least on every floor in our lab buildings, you get a, a coffee lounge there and we provide um, armchairs and um, a board for drawing on and a different kind of view, a different ratio of eye to hand from when you're sitting at the lab bench. And so that's the place where people go when they want to rest from the lab and they can and they meet other people ideas. there. Yeah. Then the serendipity is who you might meet in there. Mm -hmm. Then we say um, the next Nobel Prize, where is it generated at the lab bench or in the coffee lounge? Yeah. And then you can yeah. build that to another scale. And um, for example, in our lab complex at Michigan, you could be walking from the academic sciences via the complex, which is uh, really for the life sciences, mm -hmm. toward the medical center. And as you pass the commons building, which is part of the complex, um, there, it, there's uh, glass windows at the cafe level there. You can see a friend in the cafe and join them there. That's now, great. Again, yeah. that's another place for the generation of interesting ideas. Just below that is bioinformatics, which is a, another way in which the sciences all come together. Mm -hmm. They all share the same um, computer help. And we think that as they do that, they might find that their variables are much the same, just given different letters of the alphabet. So it's all, how do you arrange a serendipitous meeting? You want to do movements with your hand like this of knitting things together. Oh, another, cool. another thing there is you don't want to be too explicit. You don't, if you tell students or faculty, this is the place for you to communicate and sit down, they, they will won't do it. That. They yes. will resist yeah, it. it so very been. often we have incidental niches uh -huh. where, oh, by the way, I did want to talk to you about something. And you can sit over here and talk for a couple of minutes before you go into something else. But all of this... Nooks and crannies, so to speak. It nooks, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And all of this sort of connects with our idea of, of architecture as signs, which also connects with architecture as information giving. And in the past, architecture gave out information. Egyptian architecture had hieroglyphics, had writing all over the, all over the uh, temples, all over the uh, yeah. walls, all over the columns. Um, stained glass windows, we look at that as art. It's incidentally art. It was there to explain to you uh, different things. And the same with, with mosaics. It was there to inform the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the public who most of them were illiterate. So this idea, in our, we are in the information age, and architecture should connect with that. And therefore, we are designing buildings that do have via electron, and we're in the electronic age. Mm -hmm. So we're designing buildings that have electronic information giving quality on the surfaces. Hmm. And that rather than abstract, dramatic, theoretical, sculpture, yeah. theoretical form. What about, uh, just to, we're, we're having drawing to a close here, you've walked around Drexel, Drexel's campus. Have you any thoughts as to what kind of ideas might enliven the space here? I guess I speak both from an architectural and maybe even a planning point of view, um, just to sum up. Well, Denise could answer this better. I'll just quickly say I have not thought very specifically about this campus, but I do. We do like the idea of the type of campus which is um, which is um, urban, which is part of the city, where there, it's so different from the American yeah. tradition, uh, like where the, the Penn, the campus yeah. is in the city, but there's a quite a distinct difference yeah. between the campus, the field, and the other. Princeton is Nassau Street with all the shops on one side, and on the other side there is the, the rural kind of campus. Yeah. And this is in the tradition, the European, the continental tradition. The other tradition is the English tradition of Oxford and Cambridge. Yeah. And this tradition is one where there's some ambiguity about the what is city where the and what is university. Ends and where the and that city can begins. be very rich. That's such an light. interesting way of putting it. And then the it. other thing is, yeah. I love this this original building. I love yeah. it. I'm a great admirer yeah. of this building. Yeah, well, we love it. Love for it too. A lot of reasons. Yeah, yep. we're going to close. We're going to close right now for this part. And I want to thank you, Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, for joining us today. And I want to thank you for joining us at the Drexel Interview.